Our scripture passage this morning is back in Genesis, the beginning of the Bible. Uh, We're halfway through chapter 25. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Latushim, and Laumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Eldea. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Birlu Hiroi. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nubaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbil, Mipson, Mishma, Duma, and Massa, Hadad, Tima, Jeter, Naphish, and Kidama. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names. By their villages and by their encampments, 12 princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Well, thank you, Nikki. It's amazing how short a 34-verse chapter um, seems after a 67-verse chapter. Uh, chapter from last week, and so uh, thank you for reading that, Nikki. This morning, um, we come to another chapter in Genesis filled with genealogies, everybody's favorite, um, the genealogy sermon, and so here we go again, um, and we're not done yet um, in Genesis um, with, with genealogies, but again, it begs the question as we continue to read um, and encounter these genealogies throughout the book of Genesis, 
Everybody in their daily Bible reading a lot of times just skips over these genealogies, goes straight to the next chapter. Um, I'm guilty of that. But these genealogies beg the question, obviously, of, of why. Like, what's the, what's the point of these genealogies other than just fast-forwarding kind of events from this person to this person? Again, like, what, what's the point of all these genealogies? And not only what's the point of them within Genesis, but how in the world are genealogies from all these old people way back then who have all these funky names that most of us, other than Nikki, um, can't, can't pronounce. She did a great job. Like, what's the relevance, what's the application for any of this for us today on the Sunday after Thanksgiving in 2022? Well, think about ge genealogies just in general for a moment and kind of the, the point or the, the purpose of, and the, the benefit of, of genealogies just, just in general for just a moment and, and why genealogies are important in general that genealogies help to explain and help to show us where we're from and therefore who we are. They tell us, they explain to us, they show us where we're from and, and who we are. In other words, they help to explain our identity. They help to explain, they help to show us who we are and therefore what our identity is. And this is important, especially nowadays, right? We, we live in a culture, we live in a day and age in which people are, everybody's trying to find themselves. Everybody's trying to discover who they are, trying to discover themselves and, and who they are. And so then, if you're a Christian, then these genealogies are gonna help you to end that search. They're, they're gonna, these genealogies are gonna help to, to discover the to help to explain who you are. They're gonna help you to find yourself, which is, which is really important in, in just a practical sense. And the reason it's important is because we live out of who we are. That we live out of, our, our behavior is determined by our identity and who we are. That who you are determines your behavior. You ever thought about that? Your identity informs and determines how you live. Your identity and who you are informs and determines your behavior and how you live. Like we see this all throughout scripture, like all over scripture, particularly the New Testament. That throughout the New Testament, when Paul is trying to correct and change a church's behavior, his normal pattern is, is to begin by reminding them of who they are. In other words, he doesn't begin by saying, do this, do that, don't do that, do, don't do this. Instead, he reminds them of beginning, he begins by reminding them of, of their identity. This is who you are. This is who you are. Therefore, in light of who you are, do this. Therefore, in light of who you are, don't do that. Therefore, in light of who you are, live like this. Why does he do that? Because we live out of who we are. We behave, we feel, we live out of the identity of who we are. We see that all throughout Scripture but we know that practically in our everyday lives as well. What that means then is that if you, wanna, if you wanna change your behavior, and I would even go so far to say if you wanna, if you wanna begin to address and change just negative and, and crippling emotions and, and feelings, then the first place you need to begin is by changing your identity. And what I mean by changing your identity is is, is coming to a correct understanding of your identity and who you are. Why? Because you live out of, you respond out of who you are. And so then that's why, might not seem like it right now, but that's why these genealogies here are gonna be helpful for us, us this morning. 
that if you're a Christian here this morning, these genealogies are going to explain who you are. These genealogies are going to show us what your true identity is and who you are. Which once we see that then within these genealogies, they're going to, we're going to see the ramifications and implications and applications then of who we are have on how we live and our behavior of how we, we live. So that's, that's what we're going to see this morning within chapter 25 here in these three genealogies within this chapter here. We're, we're first going to see the purpose of these genealogies. Like, again, what's the, what's the point? What are these genealogies all about? And then after we see the purpose of these genealogies, then we're going to see the relevance of these genealogies and how these genealogies are applicable for our lives today and how they help us to understand who we are and how they then inform and flesh out our behavior in terms of how we, how we live. So let's begin by looking at the purpose of these genealogies. And you see these on your handout, really three purposes, three points here of why these genealogies, these three genealogies are here in chapter 25. And the first purpose of these genealogies is, is this. These genealogies show how before Abraham died, he became the father of a multitude of nations, just as God had promised. Before Abraham died, he became the father of a multitude of nations, just as God had promised. This is, the, this is one of the main points, purposes of these genealogies here. If you notice in, in verse 7 through 11 here, Abraham dies. So remember Abraham, right? And what we've seen all up to this point regarding Abraham. For all these chapters, we've been following Abraham and ever since the end of chapter 11. He's the one that God sovereignly chose. God sovereignly picked to enter into this special covenant relationship with. And he gave Abraham all these promises that from him was going to come a, a multitude of offspring and this great nation and that he was going to give them this great land and he was going to shower blessing upon blessings upon them. This Abraham then finally dies. And verses 7 through 11 tells us that he was buried in the same cave as Sarah in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron. And when he dies... And when he's buried, he leaves behind a whole bunch of children from three different women. And these three different genealogies here in this chapter then tell us and inform us of the children he had with these three different women. And so then verses 1 through 6 list the children he had with a woman by the name of Katara. That according to verse 1, after Sarah died, Abraham took another wife by the name of Katara. And according to verses 2 through 4, he and Katara had six children, seven grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And I'm not even going to try to attempt to pronounce their names. But those aren't the only children he had. He also had a child with an Egyptian woman by the name of Hagar. And that's what verses 12 through 18 pick up on. The verse 12 talks about how Abraham and Hagar had a son by the name of Ishmael. We've already seen this earlier in Genesis. And then verses 13 through 17 give us the genealogy of Ishmael and the 12 sons which came from him. And verse 16 refers to these 12 sons as, as princes, which is really important because if you remember in Genesis chapter 17, verse 20 God promised that from Ishmael was going to come 12 princes. And so then we see the fulfillment of that right here in verse 16. The final child then that Abraham had, then this is not final in, in terms of chronological order, but, but in the sequence of which these um, uh, genealogies are laid out, the final child then was from Sarah. And this final child was none other than Isaac. And we've seen this already all the way back in chapter 21. And we see Isaac's genealogy, starting in verse 19, really going through the rest of the chapter, which we'll get into more here in just a minute. And so then, what's the point? What's, what's the point and, and purposes of these genealogies and listing all these children's names and grandchildren's names and great-grandchildren's names and the three different women that Abraham had all these children and great, great children, 
grandchildren, great-grandchildren from and with? What's the point of all that? Well, all these genealogies, all these children's names demonstrate the fulfillment of a promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 4. A promise in which God promised and told Abraham that Abraham was going to become the father of a multitude of nations. That's what all these children are going to become. They're going to become a multitude of nations, and Abraham is the father of them all, just as God had promised in Genesis 17, verse 4. So that's the first point. Keep, keep that in mind. That's the first point in these genealogies and what they're here to show us. But that's not the only point of these genealogies. Instead, the second point of these genealogies, which surround Abraham's death here, is this. That these genealogies then show us that after Abraham died, Isaac became the heir of the covenant and promises that God made with Abraham rather than, than, than um, all the other children from Abraham. In other words, even though Abraham had all these children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, none of them received and inherited the promises and the covenant and the blessing that God made with Abraham. Only one of the children did. And that one child's name is none other than Isaac. He's the heir in which the promises and covenant that God made with Abraham are passed down to. That of all the other children that Abraham had, Isaac's the heir of the covenant and the promises that God made to Abraham. And that's the point, that's the purpose of all, all these genealogies. Not just to show how Abraham, Abraham became the father of multitude of nations, but to show that among the multitude of children, the multitude of nations that are gonna come from those children, there's only one of those children who's actually the heir who inherits the promises and the covenant and the blessings that God made with Abraham. And the passage here, all these genealogies here, highlight and want us to see and to capture that specific truth. And we see this in, in a bunch of places throughout these genealogies. Like in verse five, look at verse five. It says that Abraham gave all he had to who? To Isaac. Why, why to Isaac? Why did he give everything he had to Isaac? What about all the others? Because Isaac's the heir of the promise, not all those other children. It's also why in verse 6, Abraham sends his other sons to the east of the promised land of Canaan. He sends them to the east, away from the land of promise. He sends them to the east, away from, the, from God's place, away from God's presence, away from the land of promise. Why? Because they're not the heirs of the promise. Only Isaac is. It's why in verse 11 that God blesses Isaac after Abraham's death. Why does he bless Isaac? What about all the other children? Why didn't he bless all the other children? Because Isaac's the heir of the promises and the blessings and the covenant that God made with Abraham. Not any of Abraham, not all those other children. And so then this is the whole point. This is the whole purpose of these verse, first 18, 19 verses here. And really these first two genealogies here. And why Abraham's death is sandwiched in between these two, first two genealogies. It's to show that even though Abraham had a whole host of children and became a father of multitude of nations, that when Abraham died, there was only one of those children named Isaac who became the heir and the promises and the blessings that God made to Abraham, not any of his other children. Which then leads to the third and final point and purpose of these genealogies, which is this. Is that the, the third and final genealogy, starting verse 19, that we're going to see in this chapter of Isaac, shows us how in a shocking and sad turn of events, Isaac's younger son Jacob became the heir of the covenant and promises God made with Abraham and his offspring, rather than Isaac's oldest son Esau. In other words... In the previous two genealogies, we saw how Abraham passed down the covenant and the promises that God made with him to Isaac. So God made this covenant and promises with Abraham, and then Abraham passed that down to his, his, his heir, Isaac, 
And then the question now is, okay, who does Isaac now pass the covenant and the promises and the blessings that God made with Abraham that were passed down to Isaac? Now, who does Isaac pass them down to? Well, that's what verse 19 shows us. And this is surprising and shocking. Look at verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And so then as soon as you read that, you're thinking, uh-oh, like we've been down this road before, right? Like with, with, with Sarah, she was barren, and we had to wait like 25 years and go through all these twists and turns and this roller coaster ride about nine or 10 chapters before Sarah ever, ever gave birth to a, to a child. But this time, instead of taking like nine chapters and twists and turns all along the way and wondering if, if Rebecca is ever gonna have a child, here in verse 21, we're just, we're like immediately told, and Rebecca's wife conceived. And when we read that, it comes across as if one day she was barren, Isaac prayed, and bam, immediately Rebecca conceives a child. The reality, though, if you continue reading, this took 20 years. They get married, she's barren. And Isaac prays and 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 prays. And the text makes it seem like immediately it just happened in a moment. She was barren and she conceived. But the reality is it took 20 years for Rebecca to conceive a child from the moment they were married. So Isaac and Rebecca had to wait not 25 years as long as Abraham and Sarah, but they did have to wait a long time. They had to wait 20 years. Look then at verse 22. The children, and you read that, and you're like, what? Like, it'd be like you, you go in to see the doctor, to get a, see how the baby's doing, and the doctor looks at you and says, they're doing fine. And you're like, they're? You mean he? You mean she? Like, there, you mean... More than one? And the doctors yell, yeah, there's more than one. You're, you're having twins. And that's what's happening here in verse 2. You would think, verse 22, end of verse 21, when Rebecca, his wife, conceived, verse 22, and the child, but instead in verse 22, you read the children, and you're like, children, that, that means two. That means more than one. And you're like, yeah, exactly, more than one. There's, there's more than one in there. There's more than one child in there. She's having twins. And the, the rest of verse 22, really through the rest of the chapter then, we learn some really important truths about these twins, about these two children, about these two children that are in Rebecca's womb. First, we learn about their struggle. And we see that in the rest of verse 22. It says, the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she sent to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And so then here's Rebecca. She feels this like this struggle. Never had a baby, so I don't... Had a kidney stone once, but uh, I don't know exactly... More than once, but uh, know exactly what's going on here. Uh, I didn't ask my wife about this either. Maybe that would have been helpful. But there's this, she feels this struggle, like this war, this, this conflict, this battle that's happening inside of her so she goes to the lord and she asks the lord lord what in the world is going on inside of me and he tells her hey guess what there, there's just not one one kid in there there's there's two and these two babies these two children are, are going to become two nations that are one day going to be at war with one another conflict with with one another and he doesn't tell them tell her this yet but the, he's referring to, to the israelites and the, the edomites 
And not only that, he, he tells her that, that, these baby, that these babies, that there's going to be, one's going to be stronger than the other. And not only that, he goes on to say that the older is going to serve the younger, which would have been like mind-blowing because culturally in that day, like, like the, the younger serves the, serves the older, not, not, not the other way around. And so that's, that's their struggle. There, there's this battle, there's this conflict, there's this war that's a precursor that, to show the struggle and the battle and the war that, the, that those two nations that are going to come from these two babies are going to have for years to come. In verse 24 through 26, then we see their names. Look at verse 24. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. So then this is the oldest of the two. So he, he came out first, and his name is Esau. And he came out with this red complexion, and while, like with a whole lot of hair. I mean, like a whole lot of hair. Like he, he was so hairy, he looked like he was wearing a hairy coat. And so, which is, is where the name Esau then came from. Look then at verse 26. Afterward then, his brother, so this is the younger one, he's born second, came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was six years old when she bore them. So then this is the, the younger one that comes out. The second one who comes out by the name of Jacob. And the reason they named him Jacob is because the name Jacob means heel, means heel grabber. And that's what Jacob was doing when he came out of Rebekah's womb. He was grabbing onto Esau, the firstborn's heel. Again, a picture of the precursor of the, of the battle and the conflict that's going to that's gonna come from these two nations, from these two children and the nations that are going to come from these two children for years to come. So that's their struggle, their names. Now look at their differences. See this in verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Esau loved Jacob. So like these two boys are like night and day different. It's kind of the picture here. Esau was like this rugged outdoorsman who liked to hunt, and, and so he was, his father, preferred, his father preferred him. While Jacob preferred to, their conditioning, right? He, he preferred to dwell in tents, to stay inside. And so his mother preferred him. So when it says that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob, that doesn't mean that, that they didn't love the other child, it just, the idea of the word love there means preferred, kind of partiality, kind of favoritism, preferred is the picture there. It's then leads, so that's their, 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 their differences, which then lead to the most important main point of the story, which we're going to spend most of our time on, which is their exchange now, their exchange. And we see this in verse 29. Look at verse 29. Once when Jacob then was cooking stew in the tent, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. In Hebrew, the word Edom is similar and sounds a lot like the word red. And so then that's why Esau was called Edom. He, he not only had this reddish complexion when he was born, but he also wanted some of the red stew um, Jacob was cooking. And so this is where the Israelites... Um, arch enemies that, that the Edomites come from. They come from. They come from Esau. But look at how Jacob then responds to Esau when Esau asked him for his stew. We see his response there in verse 31. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. So in that day, uh, a birthright was like kind of a big deal, a really, really big deal. The birthright of the firstborn meant that he would receive um, a double portion of his father's inheritance. And not only that, but within the context of Genesis, the firstborn was also the rightful heir of the covenant and promises and blessings 
that God made with Abraham. And so then, put all that together. And this is the exchange here that Jacob is offering Esau. A bowl of stew for Esau's birthright. And all the, all the rights and all the privileges that came with the birthright of the firstborn son. Look then at how Esau responds in verse 32. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And so if you're a parent, you know this trick, right? I'm hungry. I'm going to starve. I'm going to die if I don't eat right now. No, you're not. Right? Well, that's what's happening here. That's what Esau is saying here. He's not going to die. He's going to be okay. Just like your seven-year-old boy is going to be okay when he says he's hungry. In verse 33 then, look what Jacob says. Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Like that right here are some of the most tragic, sad verses in all the Bible. Like you read that and you're like, can't believe that. Like here's the Esau, his birthright. The birthright of the firstborn, not, not only a double portion of his father's in, inheritance, like the physical inheritance, but also the spiritual inheritance. The covenant and the promises and the blessings that God made to Abraham, passed down from Abraham to Isaac, supposed to be passed down from Isaac to his firstborn son, Esau. But one day, he's exhausted, he's hungry, he thinks he's going to die, and so he trades it and sells it, for a bowl of lentil soup. Like, think about that. I, I don't know how long it took, it took Esau to eat the bread and the stew here, but the way this was written, it sure doesn't seem like it took him very long at all. Did you notice that? It says, he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Like, just like that. He, he ate, he drank, he rose, he went his way, and is all gone. Like again, I don't know how long, but just in a manner of minutes, everything he traded his birthright for is, is gone. Like there's, there's nothing left of it. And he gave up the right of being the firstborn son and the covenant and the promises and the blessings that come with being the firstborn son. Like he gave all that up for what? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Twenty minutes maybe? Of short term, immediate, fleeting, passing Pleasure and gratification. Like, what a tragedy. How sad is that? So we're going to come back to that. But these are the points and purposes, then, of, of these genealogies here. That they help us to see the, the heirs of the covenant and promises that God made to Abraham, who they are, who they were passed down to, and how they were passed down. So then, if these then are the, the points and the purposes of these genealogies, then here's the question. We're going to spend the rest of our time with this. What in the world do any of these genealogies and the purposes of these genealogies then have to do with us today? What's the application? How are they relevant for our lives today? Well, that's what I want us to conclude with in the rest of our time together. Three ways these genealogies are relevant and applicable for us today. The first way is this. It's to remember that if you're a Christian, then you're a son heir of Abraham 
and an heir of the covenant and promises that God made with Abraham. Like we've talked about this before. This isn't anything new in our study of Genesis. But like, do you realize this? Like this is going back to this whole who you are and your identity. Like this, if you're a Christian, just wrap your mind around this. This is who you are. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you're an heir. You're an heir of the covenant and the promises and all the blessings that God promised to Abraham that were handed down to Isaac, that were handed down to Jacob, and on and on and on. You're an heir of all of those. And the reason that you're an heir of those isn't because of your family tree. It's not because you can trace your biological family tree all the way back back to Abraham. Instead, the reason that you're an heir of this covenant and these promises and these blessings is because of Jesus. In other words, if you continue tracing Abraham's family line from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and you just keep going down the line, all the way down the line, you're eventually gonna hit Jesus. Like go to Matthew chapter one, shows all of that. Like Jesus is in the line of Abraham and is therefore a son heir of Abraham and a recipient and an heir of all the promises and blessings that God made to Abraham. And now, though, all those who trust in Jesus by faith, meaning all those who trust that Jesus died on the cross, taking the punishment for your sin as your substitute, and who trust that three days later that Jesus rose from the dead, then all those who trust in Jesus' death and his resurrection in your place, then you'll be united with Jesus, spiritually reborn into Jesus' family, and therefore become part of Jesus' family line, and therefore heirs of all the promises and the blessings that God made to Abraham that were passed down to Isaac and passed down to Jacob and ultimately fulfilled and passed down to, to Jesus. You become part of that family line, an heir of those promises through faith in Jesus and being united with Jesus. And so then if you're a Christian this morning, this is your ultimate identity. Like this is who you are. You're an heir. And since that's true, then that means that these genealogies, these genealogies in Genesis 25, They're your genealogies. They're your family line. They're your family tree. And therefore, they're really important and relevant for you here this morning. And they're relevant for us here this morning in in two primary ways. And the first way is this, is that they provide a warning. That these genealogies here provide a warning for us. And they warn us to beware of selling our inheritance, just like, just like Esau did, for short-term, immediate pleasure and gratification. That, that's the warning. That's the, that's the application of these genealogies for our lives today. And the reason we know that this is the application for our lives today is because that's what the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament tells us. Like turn to Hebrews chapter 12 just real quick. It's near the end of your Bible. Um, Hebrews chapter 12 there in the New Testament. And I want you to see how in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 15, that the author of Hebrews applies what Esau did in Genesis 25 to us today as Christians today. That in Hebrews chapter 12, verse verse 15, the author of Hebrews gives us this warning. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or, here it comes, unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. So then do you see what the author of Hebrews is doing here? He's looking back at Genesis 25, the the chapter that we've been going through in Genesis. And he's looking back at what the son heir did there, 
Esau, the firstborn, the son heir, who should have been the son heir, at what he did at selling his birthright. And he tells the Jewish Christians that he's writing to in, in the book of Hebrews. And by extension, he's warning us and telling us, don't follow Esau's example. Don't follow in Esau's footsteps. Don't be like Esau. Don't do what Esau did. Don't trade your birthright. Don't trade your inheritance and all the promises and the blessings that come with that inheritance that you've received as the son heir of Abraham. Don't trade all that for five, 10, 20 minutes of fleeting pleasure. Or more specifically, don't trade it for five minutes of lusting after someone on the internet. Don't trade it for 10 minutes worth of popularity and being liked and accepted by others. Don't trade it for material comfort and greed and the treasures and pleasures of this world. Don't trade it and exchange it for a lie and deceit and, and cover up. Like if you're ever tempted by short term immediate pleasure, then just remember Esau and remember how stupid he was and how stupid that trade and that exchange and that deal is. Like why in the world would you give up so much for so little? It's in this way that sin isn't just immoral. Sin isn't smart. It's, it's not smart. It's, it's not worth it. And so then Esau's example here is a warning for us individually. But it's more than just a warning for us individually. It's also a responsibility for us all corporately. It's a responsibility for us all corporately. Did you notice that? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 and, and verse 16 that the main point of those verses in Hebrews 12, 15, 16, isn't that we're to make sure that we don't follow in the footsteps of Esau. Now that's true. That's an implication of what verses 15 and 16 are saying. But that's not the main point of verse 15, 16. It's not to make sure that we don't follow in the footsteps of Esau. The main point is that we're to make sure that others don't follow in the footsteps of Esau. Do you notice that? Look at verse 15 and 16 again. It doesn't say, see to it that you aren't unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. It says, see to it that no one is unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. In other words, we're to make sure that each other doesn't follow in the footsteps of Esau, not just ourselves. In other words, it's our job, it's our responsibility. Our job and responsibility isn't, isn't just to make sure that we don't follow in the footsteps of Esau, it's to make sure that, that, that no one else does. That's, that's the point of verse 15 and 16 in Hebrews 12 here. It's a corporate command that's given. And this is huge here, especially when it comes to just this whole idea of of, of being a member of, of, of any church, of, of this church. Like, like this, 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 verse 15, 16, Hebrews 12, that's not just an option. Does that make sense? That's just an, that's not an option to consider. Like, it, it's, a, it's a command to obey. It's, it's just not the responsibility for a few of us. It, it's the responsibility and job for all of us. Like for every single member of our church. That part of what it means to be a Christian, that part of what it means to be a, a member of a church, it just doesn't mean that you're just concerned about yourself and your own personal growth in Christ and your own personal holiness. 
Instead, part of what it means to be a Christian and a member of the church is that you're responsible for the spiritual growth and well-being of other members and of other Christians, not just yourself. And so this is what we talk about when it comes to like our membership class and when we introduce new members on Sunday morning, that when someone joins this church, then all the other members are saying to them, we commit to taking responsibility for your spiritual growth and spiritual well-being and watching out for you. And those that are joining our church, they're saying, I commit to take responsibility for you, everybody else's spiritual growth and well-being and to watch over you. In other words, we as members are saying, we commit to do Hebrews 12, 15, and 16. We commit to watch over and to see to it that no one does what Esau did. That no one, no member among us, sells their birthright for a bowl of lentil stew and a piece of bread. That's just not a warning that we're to make sure we don't. That's a command that we're given and a responsibility that we're given to make sure that nobody else among us does either. Does that make sense? And so then if that's not you, if this is new for you, if you're like, man, I'm not doing that. I'm just concerned about my spiritual growth and well-being. I'm not, I'm not doing much about seeing to it that, that nobody else follows in the footsteps of Esau. Let me give you two suggestions for how you can begin to, to, to live this out. The first suggestion would be this. Just get to know others in our church. Get to know others in our church. In other words, you can't see to it that others uh, don't follow the example of Esau if you don't know people in our church. And I mean really know them. Like what, where, what, what's, their, what's the greatest temptations in their hearts? What's their greatest sin struggle? What are, where, what are, where, are they, where are they wrestling with and struggling with? Like what's, what's the passions and desires and the affections of their hearts and know people on that sort of, sort of level? You, you gotta know people like that. And so regularly like invite people into your home for dinner, grab coffee with people, Come 10 minutes early before the service. Stay 10 to 15 minutes after the service. Pursuing meaningful, spiritual sort of, heart level sort of conversations with people here at church, in your DC, at home, throughout the week. You have to get to know people if it's your responsibility to see to it that no one does what Esau did. You can't do that if you don't know people or know people on a surface level. Second suggestion would be, then would be this. It's to be other-centered, just to be other-centered. In other words, to regularly be thinking about and concerned about the spiritual well-being of others in our church, rather than just thinking about yourself and just being concerned about yourself. Does that, does that make sense? Like, like that, that's, a, that's a mind shift that has to happen. That, that throughout the week, like you're going to bed at night, with people in our church on your mind, heavy on your heart, like, how are they doing? Wonder, man, they shared this at the prayer gathering. I wonder, wonder, wonder how they're doing this week. And they shared this at DC. I wonder how things are going when it comes to that. I haven't seen them in a while at, at church. They've missed DC a few times. I wonder, you just go to bed with people heavy on your heart. You go to bed with people heavy on your mind. Why? Because it's your job and responsibility to see to it that no one does what Esau did. And so when you walk into a room, whether it's this room, whether it's your, the house you're going to D.C. at, or, or any room, you're, you're walking into a room, not just eyes focused on yourself, but you're walking into this room on Sunday morning, looking around, wondering who you can, who you can follow up with, who you can check up on, who you, can, who you can see and ask questions and how they're doing and, and things that nature. And so those are just ways, just your, your other sense of your focus, your thinking about how are the spiritual growth and well-being of others. Are there others within us who are tempted to follow along and do what Esau did? And we're to see to it that that doesn't happen. So you have to get to know people and you have to be other-centered and pursuing meaningful, in-depth relationships with people because it's not an option to consider. It's a command to obey. So that's the first way. Those are just practical examples or suggestions there but those are that's the first way then if we're heirs then if we're heirs if that's who we are heirs in these genealogies these covenant promises the first way it's relevant and applicable to us 
it's, it gives us a warning. But the second way these genealogies are applicable and relevant to us as, as heirs is this, is that these genealogies should humble us and, and cause us to be in awe of God's sovereign election of us. There's no better way to keep people awake in a long sermon after Thanksgiving than to just throw in the word sovereign election at the very end of the sermon. Now everybody's paying attention. This, though, is not just the application that, hey, this sounds like a good application. Let me make this at the end of the sermon. Instead, so this is the application that Paul makes for us in the New Testament book of, of Romans. That Paul looks back at how the younger son Jacob becomes the heir rather than the older son Esau, as would have been culturally expected in that day. And he looks back on that and he makes application of that for us today. And the application he makes for us is, is found in Romans chapter 9. Just look there real quick and then we'll be done. In Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 10. In verse 10, again, Paul is looking back at Genesis 25, this account of Jacob and Esau, how Esau surprisingly is the one who became the heir, although he was the youngest one. And he makes this application for us. Here's how it's relevant for us. He brings this to us in our day. Verse 10. And not only so, but also, Romans chapter 9, verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, then he quotes verse 23 from Genesis 25 here, the older will serve the younger. And so then, do you see Paul's application here of these verses? He's saying that God's choice of Jacob to be the heir, even though he was the younger one and shouldn't have been the heir, God's choice of Jacob to be the heir had absolutely nothing to do with Jacob. And it had absolutely nothing to do with Esau. It's not like Jacob showed a lot more promise than Esau in the womb. Yeah, so he's gonna be there. Or that Jacob in the womb was like more righteous than Esau. Or that Jacob was a lot more responsible and faithful and dependent in the womb than, than Esau. Instead, God chose Jacob to be the heir rather than Esau before any of them had even been born meaning before any of them had done anything good or anything bad. Before any of that, God told Rebecca, hey, Rebecca, the older Esau is gonna serve the younger Jacob, meaning the younger Jacob is gonna be the heir, which means then that God's choice of Jacob to be the heir was unconditional, meaning there weren't any preset conditions that Jacob had to meet first in order for God to choose him to be the heir. God's choice of Jacob was unconditional. It was simply based upon God's free, sovereign choice. That's the only reason Jacob got chosen to be the heir and not Esau. And if you're a Christian here this morning, this is the only reason you're an heir. This is the only reason you're an heir of the covenant and the promises that God made to Abraham as well. Like, like, make no mistake about it. Like, you're not an heir of all these promises and blessings because you're so cool or because you're just smarter than all those non-Christians out there and you could figure out the gospel yourself. Or, or because God looked down the corridor of time and and saw the decision you were gonna make and how faithful and dependable you were gonna make and since you were gonna choose him, he chose you. That's not elect, sovereign election. That's you election. That's, that's man election. And that's not the picture here. The only reason that you're an heir, 
like receive this, hear this, is because for some unknown reason, God, by his free, sovereign choice, chose to make you one. Just like he chose Jacob to be an heir as well. And the reality of that, the reality of knowing that the only reason I shouldn't be an heir, I shouldn't, Jacob shouldn't, but the only reason that you, the only reason that Jacob, the only reason that me are heirs is because of God's free, sovereign choice. And the reality of that then should have two effects on our lives. And I'll close with this. First, it should humble us. It, it should humble us, right? Like if, if you didn't do anything, if God's choice of you wasn't based on any conditions that you had to meet, and he still chose you to be an heir of the promises and these blessings, then the reality of that, you, 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 you don't have any reason to take credit for anything. And the reality of that should, should humble you, astonish you, leave you speechless. Like how Charles Spurgeon said it, he said, I believe the doctrine of election because I'm quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I'm sure that he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. Like that's the effect, that's the kind of humility that the reality of God's sovereign election should produce in our lives. That's the first effect. The second effect of God's sovereign election should be this. It should compel us to worship. It should compel us to burst out in praise and worship for the one who chose us. And so then, in the midst of a day and age in which everybody's seeking to find themselves and discover who they are and what their true identity is, if you're a Christian, think about it. This is, this is who you are. You're, you're an heir. You're an heir of the covenant, the promises, and the blessings that God made with Abraham. And as an heir then, that's your fundamental core identity. As an heir then, in the midst of temptation to sin, in the midst of just even chunking the Christian life to pursue after the worldly pleasures and treasures of this world and life. I just remember who you are. Remember the, the negative example of Esau. Don't follow in the footsteps of Esau. Instead, remember who you are and take responsibility for one another and to see to it that no one here among us follows the example in the footsteps of Esau either. And as an heir, remember how you became an heir. You didn't work for it, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, there's nothing that you did. Instead, God, before the beginning of time, he chose you based upon his free, sovereign choice to make you an heir to the promises and covenant that he made with Abraham, just like he chose Jacob. And let the reality of that then humble you and compel you to worship. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, how you remind us of who we are. Um, Lord, there's so many things today in which we seek to find our identity in, uh, from our emotions and our feelings to um, sin um, that we might um, partake in and struggle in, um, to images that we want to project, uh, to images that others want us to be and identities that others want us to be. But Lord, I pray that in the middle of that, that you would remind us where we came from and who we are. Lord, that we would live as heirs um, of these promises and blessings and that the reality of that would really transform just our normal, everyday lives. Help us to be humble. Help us to worship you, realizing that we did nothing to deserve uh, the identity of an heir. But it was simply based upon your, your grace and mercy that you've shown us. And help us to praise you for that. Help us to not follow in the footsteps of Esau. Help us to be wise. Help us to see the transaction and the trade that is being made um, in those moments. And so, God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.